Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fun face off between Fast API and Flash 2.0. I am super excited that you are here with me today, and I can't wait to get started. So, I just wanted to set some learning objectives uh, on what we'll cover during our time together today. So, we are going to go on a hero's journey together. Okay, that's first and foremost. And a uh, hero's journey is a popular story structure made famous by Joseph Campbell. And it's used in a lot of like Greek mythology and many cultures around the world. So I'll quickly set up our story, okay? And then we'll use this hero's journey format all throughout this talk. Then we are going to start our fun face-off, right? Between Fast API and Flask 2.0. Uh, and during this face-off, right? Between these two Python web frameworks, here are some areas we are going to go over. The first is how to quickly set up a Hello World application in both Fast API and Flask, uh, HTTP methods, focusing on a post method, automatic documentation, which is just interactive documentation used in the browser that will make your life a lot easier when debugging. And we'll see how that's done in both Fast API and Flask 2.0. We're also going to chat about uh, data validation, right? And how something called Pydantic helps us with providing user friendly errors uh, when data is invalid, uh, which is really nice. Uh, we're going to go over template folder structure, like if you want to do like a web application or web, web, web development, um, and how you would serve up HTML, what that what might look like. Lastly, we're going to cover running in production using Whiskey or WSGI versus ASGI and why you want to use one over the other. Then we'll choose, uh, you know, why you'd use Fast API over Flask and vice versa. Lastly, make sure you stay until the end because I have a freebie for you. So sit back and relax, okay? Get your cup of coffee or your water and let's go on this hero's journey together. I feel your pain. Okay, imagine you're banging your head against the wall at work. And you're trying to choose between Python web frameworks, Flask versus Fast API. And you're caught in this, caught up in this vicious cycle, right? You you choose one, and then you want to choose the other one, and you keep going back and forth, and you just can't make up your mind. And as if your day couldn't get any worse, your boss comes to you on a Friday, okay, with 15 minutes left in your day, and he says, "I need a huge favor." You know, he kind of has his hands on his hips, or pointing pointing at you, and you're thinking to yourself, "Oh my God." Oh my God, like what could he possibly need right before the weekend? And he says to you, you know, we just want our biggest customer ever. And I need you to choose the Python web framework today. And you're like, today, I mean, you're not sure if you can do it because you have, you have plans with your friends later tonight. And besides your tech lead is not in the office at the moment, or you might even be the tech lead. I'm not sure you might be. Um, so you commit the cardinal sin. And you ask your boss, can I do it on Monday? Your boss looks angry, very angry. And he starts shaking and trembling. And then his body becomes engulfed in a tornado. And he's swallowed right in the middle of it. And his skin's ripping apart. And he turns into the evil internet ice lady. And you're like, what the shapeshifter heck is going on here? <laughs> And she laughs evilly, ha, 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 ha. You will choose between Fast API and Flask 2.0 today, or else I will use my powers to freeze the internet forever. You quickly think to yourself, oh my God, like if the internet is frozen, I won't be able to watch Avengers or binge watch Loki. Then you say to the evil internet ice lady, okay, I will do it under one condition. I need to send a Slack message to someone. With malice in her voice, she asks, who might that be? And you say, my tech lead. Hi, I'm Tanya. <laughs> uh, I'm a former professional athlete turned Pythonista, 
I played pro ball in Europe and a little bit in the WNBA here in the States. Um, so along with Python, you may see some sports references during the story. So I hope you like sports. Uh, and I'm currently a Python developer advocate at Vantage, uh, which is a leading communications API provider. Um, you can use our APIs to build applications using like video, voice and text messaging and much more. Our customers range from like the telehealth industry to insurance companies to startups. So before we continue with our hero's journey uh, and our fast API versus fast you know, face-off, I would like to set some expectations. Uh, and I, I might go back to the basics sometimes because everyone here might be at different learning stages. And I'm not sure, I mean, you, know, you could be more senior, more junior, more mid-level. So sometimes you will see me go back to the basics and explaining things. Um, yes. So. Um, because I'm not sure about you, but when I first learned how to code, it felt like my head was going to explode. So I don't want you to have that experience. And what has your coding journey been like? Uh, I would love to know more about you, how your journey, coding journey has gone and how it's going now. Um, yeah, so I would just learn, love to learn more about you. And if you like sports, who are your favorite sports teams? So back to our story. You just finished messaging your tech lead and she gave you a major pep talk. She's like, you know, she reminded you of all the hard work you've put in and all the new things you've learned over the last several months. And now you're feeling super. You feel confident that you can pass the evil ice ladies challenge and save the world from frozen internet. So let our face off between fast API and flask begin. So the evil internet ice lady barks at you. Tell me how flask and fast API are alike. And you say, well, both are high performance and lightweight Python web frameworks. They are both micro frameworks and are stripped down without all the bells and whistles, so it allows for flexibility. Then she says, hmm, okay, well, tell me how they are different. And you say, one is battle tested and the other one is newer. One comes with lots of built-in libraries and the other one you have to install some extensions. The evil internet ice lady scrunches her nose at you. Hmm. Then she demands you tell her how to get a quick Hello World application up and running in both Flask 2.0 and Fast API. So you say, okay, there's two things to, under to understand when running your Hello World application. The first are decorators. And decorators are functions which modify the functionality of other functions. They start with the at symbol followed by the name of the decorator. You continue. You can think of it like decorating a cake. It starts with something. Then you modify it by adding the frosting, the flowers, and the sprinkles. The next thing to understand is a route. A route maps a function to a URL, so it knows which web page to take the user to making the request. You're on a roll. Then you explain the code as the evil internet ice lady gawks at you. So in versions of Flask prior to Flask 2.0, this uh, app.route is the decorator here, the at app.route. And it's routing or mapping this function home to the URL. Uh, in this case, it's a backslash, which is the root or the index page. And it just returns the hello world uh, dictionary here. In Flask 2.0, things get much simpler. Route decorators were added for common HTTP methods like get, and it still maps to the function home and returns hello world. And it gets served up on port 5000 by default, Well, you can change the port if you like. Flask 2.0 is very similar to Fast API with 
a simple Git route, although FastAPI was the first to incorporate, uh, you know, mapping the route to each HTTP methods. Uh, so from the beginning, FastAPI uses an HTTP, met HTTP method in the route. In FastAPI, all the HTTP verbs like git, post, put, delete have their own decorators. Uh, and then you're just returning a dictionary with hello world. Fast API gets served up on port 8000 by default, but once again, you can always change the port and it returns hello world. So both require a little code to get a hello world app up and running. The evil ice lady is looking even more evil. And she says, okay, well, let's see what you know about running and development from the terminal. You take a deep breath. Then you say, running code locally in your machine first so you don't put error prone code in production. Yes, yes, very important. So let's talk about this. So to run in development in Flask, from your command line, you have to export your main Python file right, which in this case is app.py. You run the Flask development server by running Flask run. But if you want to make a code change, you'll have to keep restarting the development server every time. And in order to keep the development server running, you have to export development into the Flask underscore env variable, like so. With Fast API, running and development is pretty awesome uh, because Fast API uses something called hot reloading. And hot reloading keeps the app running when you're making code changes, right? So you don't have to keep restarting the development server. And all you have to do is pass in the reload flag in the terminal here. Uh, and to start the server, you just type uvicorn main colon app where main is the name of your Python file you're running. So main.py, right? And think of Uvicorn as a, as a lightning fast server that allows your application to perform faster. So hot reloading will save you lots of uh, development time because your application reloads automatically anytime you change the code. Evil Ice Lady says, that is correct, okay? But how would you execute an HTTP method like a post request? You take a drink of water, which I'm gonna do now. <laughs> and you clear your throat. Then you take in a deep breath and say, HTTP methods are action-oriented verbs. And so we've covered, we've already covered how to do a get, um, which is read-only. So let's see how to do a post in Flask and Fast API. A post request is for creating a resource, okay? So for like submitting data, like a form to the server. In Flask, prior to Flask 2.0, let's say we have this list of dictionaries called teams. Okay, you see my sports references here? This is my favorite basketball team, Milwaukee Bucks. <laughs> and um, in previous versions of Flask, you'd have to pass in a list called methods to the decorator and specify the type of request, which is a post. Flask 2.0 makes it much easier, just like we saw with our Git request. Um, all you have to do is specify the HTTP method post in the decorator. Um, okay, uh, and this is a new team that you would like to create or add to your existing list of dictionaries. And then you return you return it using JSONify, which turns the Python dictionary into JSON, so the server can interpret the data. Uh, but if you pull up your browser and go to the route, you'll actually get a 405 method, not a loud error, because this is a post request. And by pulling up a web page, that's doing a Git request. So you have to use an external tool, something called like you can use like Postman, which acts as a client. So you can see your post requests and the data that you've created in JSON format. Uh, Fast API in Flask 2.0 is uh, very similar when it comes to post requests, uh, except for one exception. Um, 
which we'll talk about uh, in a minute, but Fast API provides separate decorators as well for each HTTP method, like at app.get, app.pulse, delete, and put. Um, so with Fast API, you don't have to use a tool like Postman. Okay, you don't have to use Postman to test your Pulse requests. Uh, the evil internet ice lady interrupts you and she says, yes, I know Fast API, you don't need to use Postman. So tell me, how would you test Pulse requests using automatic documentation? You take a deep breath because you know this answer will be important and you can't screw up now. So you explain automatic documentation is an interactive API documentation where you can see your request in the browser, such as Pulse request and interact with them like passing in data and seeing what response that you get back. It's like magic, really, that'll make your life easier and you don't need to use Postman. This is how automatic documentation Fast API works. Fast API is based on something out of the box called Pydantic. So there's no need to install it. Pydantic is a framework for easily modeling and validating data. Pydantic also does data validation and uses Python type hints. Um, which in which you'll get friendlier data validation areas errors, which reduces debugging time. So type hints are just what they sound like. They hint at the type of variable type that you're using, uh, and they help document code and catch bugs sooner. An example of a type hint uh, would be here: this variable, which is player underscore ID, followed by the type int or integer. Pydantic also works together with something called Swagger UI uh, for the automatic documentation, which allows you to visualize and interact with your APIs in your browser. So to create the Pydantic model for automatic documentation, you would use uh, Pydantic and you would import uh, the base model from Pydantic. Okay, and then our class will inherit, um, our class will inherit from this base model. So for example, both your parents have brown eyes, it's highly likely that you'll inherit their brown eyes as well. Um, and inheritance and object-oriented programming works the same way. So here we're importing, importing base model. Uh, we have a class called player. Uh, okay, that inherits from base model and we're declaring variables as type hints. So as you can see, like player underscore name is type string, player underscore team is type string, player underscore age is type int. And inside our function definition, we have a parameter we're passing in called request, okay? And this is the type of player that is, a sorry, that is a type player. Okay, and this is actually a type in, right? You're just saying, pass in this variable called request of type player. Uh, and it returns a dictionary. Okay, so this is like the boring part of automatic documentation. So let's get to some really awesome stuff. Uh, so to access automatic documentation, you would just go to your local host slash docs. And you'll see a schema which is like a skeleton for your model with your variables. And here you can see which variables are required or optional. The, we don't have any optional variables in this example, but the required variables all have red asterisks next to them. And you can also try it out. Uh, there is a try it out button. Uh, it's not in this screenshot, but there is a try it out button to, that you can use to test your API endpoints by passing in values for the variables. So here we're passing in like player name, Michael Jordan, player team, Chicago Bulls, player age, 32. So it's kind of like a sandbox, right? You can pass in variables to the sandbox and then you click execute, okay? And this will give you the response body or what the server will receive for the post request. You also get back a curl request. 
Okay, and which lets you talk to a server by sending data or making a request through the command line. It generates it for you automatically, so you don't have to write it from scratch. With Flask, there's no built-in feature for automatic documentation, excuse me, generation um, in Flask. Um, you have to use the Flask Swagger extension, which requires a lot of configuration, um, as it doesn't come out of the box uh, with Swagger. Automatic documentation comes out of the box with Fast API, so you don't have to install anything. Um, and it uses Pydantic out of the box as well. The evil internet ice lady creeps closer to you. She sticks her icy finger in your face and she demands you tell her about data validation and why it's important. You continue. Well, data validation uses our friend Pydantic. An example of data validation fast API would be something like this. We can create a class that inherits from base model again. So our class name here is login and base model is a Pydantic model with type into variables, right? Username, password, are both strings and agreed to terms is an optional Boolean. In our function, okay, we check if username equals Jane Doe and password equals password one, two, three, four, five. Um, if it's successful, then it returns a message success. If it fails or not successful, if the data is invalid, we fail it and the message uh, of authentication failed gets returned. So, when you use automatic documentation for data validation, we can once again, click the try it out button and pass in data into our little sandbox here. So for the username, I'm gonna pass in none. Password is, we'll leave uh, as password one, two, three, four, five, which is correct. And agree to terms, we'll just set it to true. Pydantic will work its magic. So you'll get a friendly, sorry, you'll get a friendly message telling you uh, exactly what the error is. And in this case, our error is expecting value, uh, expecting value, right? The message MSG here, expecting value line two, column 15, char 16. It, and th that's exactly right because we passed in none to the username. So uh, you're, you know, this automatic documentation or Pydantic is expecting a value, which we didn't get. In Flask, Pydantic, Pydantic does not come out of the box. So you can install it uh, using uh, Flask-Pydantic for data validation. So with Fast API, you get Pydantic out of the box. Uh, which gives you friendly error messages and reduces the time spent debugging, which is always nice. The evil internet I say is furious and she calls you a know-it-all. Then she asks, well, what if I want to create a web page? What's this template folder business? You can feel you're coming down to the home stretch and you're more relaxed and you say, the templates folder stores your HTML files if you want to build a web application. In Flask, by default, Flask looks for HTML templates in a templates folder and stores your HTML files like index.html, players.html. In Flask, you have to import render underscore template here. Then you serve up the HTML file you want to render, which in this case is our index.html. In both Flask and Fast API, you have to use Jinja. Okay, it's a templating language uh, to display your variables in HTML. Uh, and Jinja is a templating engine that allows you to write code similar to Python to display that HTML. And here's an example of what that looks like. So for example, here's your index.html file. To display variables in Jinja, you have to surround the variable with double curly braces, like so.
in Fast API, you have to explicit, explicitly define the templates folder in your code. Uh, so the first thing that you can do uh, is create the templates folder right in your project director, directory like we did in Flask. Then in your code, you import Jinja two templates from Fast API like so. Next, you would create a templates templates objects or variable that you can use to, that you can reuse later. Okay, and here in the function uh, definition, the request type in Fast API will know uh, to pass the request. Okay, and that parameter you want return in the template. Lastly, you use the templates you created earlier uh, to render and return a template response. As you can see here, uh, and you just pass in the request and your variable, which in our case is the player ID as a dictionary, um, as one of the key value pairs. So the uh, it's, this is like a context. You probably heard the term context. Um, so you can access it in Jinja 2 later, just like we did in Flask earlier. So with Flask, you just need to create the templates folder and call render template. So it is a little bit um, uh, in, more intuitive to work with that. So at this point, Ice Lady is standing directly in front of you and you can taste her icy breath and with her arms folded and her veins like popping out of her forehead, she grunts, last thing, running in production. You can smell victory, but you don't wanna give up now. So you say, going live so the whole world can see. In Fast API, production is pretty marvelous because it uses ASGI, uh, which is an interface that sits between a Python web server and a framework. Uh, and ASGI is special because it allows for async Python applications, which make, makes them lightning fast. ASGI is asynchronous, okay? And this is how asynchronous applications work. Imagine this, okay? You have a bunch of requests coming in, um, and they don't have to wait for the other ones to complete or finish before they start processing. So there's overlap here with requests and that makes it much faster, okay? So think of it like ordering food at a restaurant. Um, you can order food and other people don't have to wait for you to order their food, right? And the restaurant workers are continuously taking orders, cooking and serving food. With Flask, Flask uses something called WSGI or WSGI or the Python Web Server Gateway Interface, which has been the Python standard for many years now. And WSGI is synchronous. So imagine you have a bunch of requests coming in and each request has to wait in line for the others before it to complete. And notice there is no app overlap like there was with our with a, uh, ASGI. Um, you can think of this this example uh, kind of like a queue data structure or like FIFO first in first out. You can also think of it like waiting in line at the movie theater and you're at the end of the line and you have to wait for the other people in front of you to get their ticket. So ASGI makes for fast performance in your web applications because the way they process requests asynchronously. The evil ice lady is super angry and she pulls out her sword and puts it up to your neck and says, she was a winner. So you think to yourself, okay, this is a trick question and you're feeling conflicted. So this is how you answer. My winner? Okay, this is how I would choose. Use Flask for this. It's battle tested. Okay, it's been around for a long time, so it's reliable. Use it for, you know, getting up a quick prototype. Use it for web application because you saw how easy it was to use a template folder. Use Fast API for this. If you want to increase your development speed, time, and performance, okay, I would use Fast API. 
use fast API if you want to reduce errors and bugs because of Pydantic and the data validation and type hinting. Use it for API development. Uh, I, in my opinion, I feel like it's going to definitely become the standard in the near future, like really near future in many years to come for APIs. And documentation, fast API, right? Uh, if you want to get up and running quickly with a new framework, use fast API uh, because uh, for many reasons, but uh, the documentation is amazing. Uh, it's probably the best I've ever seen actually uh, in tech. Ice Lady lunges towards you. You remember, you remember what your tech lead said earlier, to kill the evil Ice Lady, say these three words, say these words three times, melt, melt, melt. The evil internet Ice Lady melts away forever. The internet is restored to the world and you get to binge watch all of your favorite shows again. You are the hero, hence hero's journey, <laughs> the end. So, um, Hope you enjoyed that story and our face off and we have a freebie for you. Um, we are giving you a coupon code to try our APIs at Vonage. Um, you can just take a screenshot of this or write down the, the code, which is in, uh, highlighted in the hot pink there. Um, and yeah, so we're giving you this free credit. It's 10 euro, I believe, uh, to use our APIs and to build cool stuff. And it's redeemable until December 19th of this year. I would like to thank uh, the PyCon APAC Thailand team. Thank you so much for putting together, together this amazing conference and allowing us uh, the opportunity to uh, share, um, you know, this uh, fast API and first flask 2.0 face off. Thank you so much for everything. And I would love to hear from you. Uh, if you're listening to this talk, um, this is where you can find me. Um, uh, I'm on Twitter at Tanya Sims. So hope to hear from you and have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Hi, guys. We are with Tanya now. Tanya is a Python enthusiast as a Hall of Fame former professional basketball player. She's passionate about the Python language and look forward to building thriving developer community as Vonage. Tanya, thank you for joining me today on live Q&A about phase of fun with Python framework. Fast ABI vs Flags, uh, the hero journey that you are your storytelling is very interesting. Mm -hmm. By the way, so before we start, before we start, I have my basketball with me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. I love that. It's perfect. Yeah, which I didn't, which I didn't touch for like uh, six months. Uh, okay. You sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can send you. it to me. You send it to me, and I'll sign it, and I'll send it back to you. <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> okay, okay. So we will start with the first question. Uh, Tanya, this is a question from Andy. Mm -hmm. Does Fast API have something like flags, groupings, allowing you to separate section of your code base? For example, build, when building a web application, you might have a grouping for the main UI, one for the admin interfaces, and another for the payment gateway, etc. Yeah, this is, I love this question because uh, I've been doing this talk since May, although it's been a little different, but this is the first time someone's asked me about this. <clears throat> so yes, uh, Fast API does have, they have something called API router, which is like the equivalent to blueprints and Flask. Um, and, you know, in your code, you know, and within your Python file and Fast API, you can just create like a, an instance of API router. Um, and then you can use that instance or that variable or object. Um, you can actually, uh, like, for example, if your instance is called router, you can actually invoke the HTTP methods, like get, post, put, delete uh, on that API router instance. So, for example, you could have, you know, in the, in the decorator above your function, at the at symbol router.get or router.post, and then you can put your endpoint URL, your path parameter, path operation, whatever you want to call it, inside of that, uh, that decorator. Um, that's kind of a basic example, but like a, a more, I would say, commonly used one, especially if you have like larger uh, or like a bigger, uh, more files, a larger file structure, is you can actually reference API routers. Um, so for example, if you have like a user's um, API router um, with your Git post 
put delete operations in there. In that file, you can use like a main.py file, or it doesn't have to be called main.py, it can be like your main Python file, and then you can actually reference that API router from users uh, using the include underscore uh, router uh, function. So, so yeah, so that was a long answer, but uh, the answer is yes. API router is what you can use. Um, and uh, FastAPI has amazing documentation. So um, they have a whole, you know, two, three pages of documentation, very detailed documentation about what you can do using a API router and FastAPI. Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Andy, I think it's our uh, answer your question, right? Andy's here too. Hey, Andy. Okay, okay we're moving to the next question. Do fast API have admin interface level? Uh oh, uh, does it have a yeah? Uh, so <clears throat> you can actually install a third party extension. It's called I think it's called Fast API Admin. Uh, mm -hmm. which is inspired by Django, because I, I think that's one of the, yeah. the nicest yeah. features, you know, Django yeah. having that admin dashboard. Yeah. Um, and you can do, like, really the same things that you can do in that Django admin dashboard, like do CRUD operations and things like that. It just mm -hmm. takes a little bit of configuration, but it's pretty straightforward um, yeah. for fast API admin. There's, like, a GitHub repo for it, and there's also, it's on PyPy as well, so. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question, what were some of the key finding or setback when you were exploring FAST and FAST API? Hmm. Great question. So I'll start with Flask because that's the one that I've been doing the longest. But um, so when I first started learning Flask, I, you know, as a kind of a newbie or beginner, like I kind of felt like the docs were a little bit harder to, to digest for someone who was just starting out. Um, so I went and purchased a course by a gentleman named Miguel Gringberg. And if, if everybody in the Flask community knows him because he teaches a lot of Flask stuff. And it was like a video course. And he also has that blog. It's like a course online too, which is free. It's called the Flask Mega Tutorial. Um, so I would say that is one set back end key finding. Uh, for Fast API, uh, as I was saying earlier, like the documentation for Fast API is like some of the, it's really some of the best I've ever seen before. Uh, because it's like very clear, concise, and it reads kind of like a story. Um, and I feel like even if I'm like, um, even if I'm uh, reading up on something like something in Fast API, I'm learning something about something else. I mean, it's really it's really awesome. So I definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, in terms of like a setback, I would say the only setback was when I was trying to do like website development, and it's just a, like a little minor thing, but like. Uh, in Fast API, you would still like declare the templates folder like you would. Oh, sorry, define the templates folder like you would in Flask. But uh, in Fast API, you have to like explicitly define the templates folder in your in your code. Um, but I mean, I think that's just like a minor a minor thing um, in Fast API. Uh, and another key finding for Fast API that I you know learned about as I was doing it is. Um, it has built-in support. It's asynchronous support is built in by default. So like you can get like the async and await keywords by default, so. Yes, thank you for your answer. Sure. Okay, the next question for beginners, which mm -hmm. one of them you recommended to get hand on? Flask mm -hmm. and Flask API. Hmm. Um, wow, that's hard, that's a hard question because you know, <laughs> Flask has been around for a long time. Yeah. You know, it is a micro framework. It's, you know, everybody learns at their own pace in their own way. Um, but it is, I think it flasks is easier to learn than like a Django. Uh, but if I were just starting out now and as a beginner, I definitely would suggest Fast API just because I'm telling you, like the documentation is really, really good. If you had a, haven't had a chance to check it out, definitely check it out. There's like a beginner section and an advanced level section too. Um, it's easy to learn, easy to use. Uh, it is, um, you know, there's like minimal code to write, even more minimal than Flask. Uh, uh, it increases like, I mean, you're going to have like a whole like different developer experience. Uh, it's, you know, faster to, to actually like develop something. And you're going to also decrease bugs and defects, which I know is like, something frustrating for everybody, but especially for people starting out. And 
um, if you've seen the talk, like the reason why the buzz will be decreased is because Fast API uses Pydantic uh, for like in mm -hmm. type hinting, which is used for data validation. Oh, you can can you talk about the bugs more? Uh, pardon? Yeah, can you talk about the bugs more? The Pydantic stuff that you refer to? Pydantic. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, Pydantic. So Pydantic is just a way to like handle uh, yeah. data validation. Um, you can like import, you can import it in Fast API, and then you create a class that inherits from Pydantic. And within that class, you you know you have to use like type hints. So yeah. uh, it's going to just you know do extra checking for you, making sure you're like, using the correct types, and um, you know just do a lot of like the data validation for you as well. Okay, and thank you, Tonya. Sure. Okay. Next question. Most of us in this weekend are coming to learn, experiment, and try new things ourselves. What kind of advice you could give to them? Uh, well, I would definitely say, like, you know, um, I mean, learning something new is always great. You know, I love learning new things all the time. Just know that, like, sometimes when you're learning something new, like, frustration is part of the process of learning, like whether you know, you know, you're know you starting your coding journey or if you've been coding and you wanna like learn a framework like Fast API or Flask, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's gonna be a little frustration, but that's okay, you know, it's, it's fine. It's like a natural part of the process. So just have fun with it. And don't even think of it like a process, think of it more as a journey, right? Um, and then another advice I would have, piece of advice I would have is uh, you wanna stay out of like what I call t tutorial purgatory and what that is, is like when you do like a tutorial, either whether it's like, I don't know, on video or on, you know, a written tutorial or from a book, um, try not to follow the tutorial like line by line, like code by code, yeah. you know, uh, still follow the tutorial, but build your own projects and write your own code. Um, and I think that's like a, I think it'll stick, you know, what you're learning will stick more and um, you'll feel more confident because you've actually like, built your own project. Well, thank you, Chanja. It's the last question for me. You are a former professional basketball player. How do you turn to software engineer and what's motivate you? Can you tell us? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so I played professional basketball. I played uh, in Europe for a year. I was in Poland for a year, then I played a little bit here in the States and the WNBA, which is like the women's NBA. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I started playing battle well, sports in general when I was like, literally when I was like a baby. <laughs> but no, when I was like five, I started playing basketball. And, but I always wanted to do something in tech as well, just because when I was little, like my parents bought a computer, um, it was something kind of unheard of back then. Uh, but um, I remember I just found this letter in, from high school. I think it was like my sophomore year of high school. I was in this business program at in school for like you know uh, uh, future entrepreneurs, and we had to write about like what we wanted our future to be like and what we wanted to do as a career. And I I, I just found this letter, but I said I want to do something with computers. Um, so I guess I've always wanted to do something with computers. But I think that like you know when you're an athlete, uh, you know let, let, let's just say basketball, right? Like you have to be creative and analytical, kind of at the same time, like. The creative, the creativeness comes from, or the creativity comes from, like, uh, you know, having to move without the ball, or like when you have the ball, doing a one-on-one -on -one move. You're kind of like an artist with the ball, and then the analytical part comes from like being able to like analyze plays quickly. So in basketball, like if there's like, you know, five seconds left on the clock, and your coach calls a timeout, and she draws up a play, and um, you have to know how to like analyze that information quickly and execute it quickly as well. So, so yeah, I think they kind of like go together. I know like those two worlds don't seem like they go together, right? Like the, the coding and the sports, but um, it's a little similar. So. Wow. That's very cool. So please do sign this. <laughs> I'll virtually sign it. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. So, so any strategy from our basketball play you play, and you can apply to programming, stuff like that. Ooh, that's a good question. Any strategy? Yeah. yeah. Let me think, let me think. Uh, well, I would think, I mean, I would say one thing. I remember like in college when I was playing, I, um, you know, it was like a really close game. It was like, I think we were, I don't know, down by one or something and our coach 
called a timeout with like five seconds left and she uh, drew up a play for us. So just kind of like what I was saying, like being able to like, you know, analyze the play really quickly and execute it. But, um, you know, I think in sports and in coding, there's a lot like in the software world, there's like a lot of pressure. It's, it's high pressure. Um, so just playing sports, especially at like a high level, like it taught me how to deal with the like, candle, the pressure and deal with like really stressful situations. Um, so yeah, I guess that's like the strategy that really like popped into my mind. Uh, and also like communication, like being able to communicate with your teammates, excuse me, you know, like basketball is like a team sport, you know, what you know, and, um, you know, like in the workforce, any workforce really, you're going to have coworkers and peers and managers and bosses that you have to communicate with. And I think playing sports definitely helped me with that. Thank you. We have yeah. one question from Neil. Sure. Hey, Neil, thank you for your questions. Do you think fast API will continue to be learned when it starts to bring more functionality in the future? So he's asking, oh, let me see, there's a question in the Q&A, let me see here. Um, yeah, 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 on Q&A. Okay, yeah, I definitely think so. I know like, um, it's going to be learned when it starts to bring more, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I definitely feel like fast API will definitely be like, be the standard for API development, like in the near, near future, like very soon. <laughs> I mean, if it, is, if it isn't already, um, and I feel like it will develop, like as we go along here, it will also develop for, I mean, it's great for websites now, like for web application, website application or website development. Um, you know, just that little thing with like the templates folder, what I was saying earlier, like just explicitly defining in your code, it's a little inconvenient, but honestly, I mean, you're gonna get like much faster performance than you would in Flask because of the asynchronous support, so. Okay, Mel, I hope it's uh, answered your question. We still have one, no. Lana. Oh, we're done? Oh no. We're done. We're oh done. my God, that went by fast. <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> uh, he, you know, do we have, still have a couple of time? Nell, do you want to jump up and talk to us? Andy and Nell? And people? <laughs> I think hey. we still, yeah. I think, I think we're running out of time, right? <laughs> Oh my God, I'm, I'm really enjoying talking to Tanya and I really love from her, hearing from her more. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so maybe, maybe if you guys want to hear from her more or want to like a shit chat with her, you can go around open space and ask her. Okay, so attendee, if you guys want to chat with Tanya more, like I said, okay. Uh, Tanya, where can we follow you or follow your amazing work? Yeah, thank you. So the best place to follow me is on Twitter. It's just at Tanya Sims on Twitter, like my name, at Tanya Sims. Um, that's the best place to follow me. That's where I'm most active on social media, so. Okay, thank you again, uh, Tanya. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, right, everyone. Enjoy the rest of conference, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Bye. Uh, I just do leave room, right? Yeah. Okay, yep. Good luck, Bye. guys. And See you later. Bye.